Hello to everyone joining us for our weekly Bible class from the book of Acts. Chapter 12 in front of us today is replete with an inevitable event, an amazing encounter, a thrilling escape, a humorous situation, and a tragic ending. All of those things we find in Acts chapter 12. An inevitable event, an amazing encounter, a thrilling escape, a humorous situation, and a tragic ending. Let's pray. Through all these episodes in this chapter, Lord, impress on us teachings that will aid us in following you in a day and a time that's not unlike we find in the book of Acts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sooner or later, it was inevitable. A clash between the state and the new movement that was exalting Jesus Christ as Lord, fueled by the dynamism of a young church brewing, it was bound to to occur. For the fifth time, the church in Jerusalem is now plagued with persecution. Sadducees, elders, rulers, and scribes persecuted the young church, Acts chapter 4. Sadducees alone, in protest against the preaching of the resurrection, which they clearly taught against, we find in chapter 5. The synagogue of the Greeks trying Stephen in chapter 6. Intense persecution by Saul of Tarsus in chapter 8. Now, this fifth siege of persecution against the Jerusalem Christians comes as Saul and Barnabas are visiting Jerusalem with famine relief aid that the church in Antioch of Syria had sent to the church through them. As we look into Acts chapter 12, whether you have your Bibles open or your devices tuned to Acts 12, we see this persecution, this fifth siege of persecution, comes from a different source than the previous ones. Not from the Sadducees or the elders or the Greeks or Saul of Tarsus. It comes from the state. Instead of the religious system, and in particular, Herod Agrippa I. Now, Jesus had predicted persecution to his disciples in his upper room discourse, that the Apostle John records in chapters 13 to 16 that took place on the eve of Jesus' crucifixion. John 15, 20 reads, If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. The Apostle Paul was to promise later persecution with his words to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, 12, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's a sobering statement. All, not some, but all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. We see the fulfillment of John 15, 20 in Acts 12. We'll see the fulfillment of 2 Timothy 3, 12 later in the book of Acts, and we see it throughout history, and today we're seeing it worldwide in places like North Korea and India and Pakistan, and the list goes on and on and now on. And now it's beginning to make inroads into the U.S. as well, with some states using COVID restrictions to shutter, silence, and stifle the church. You can find some interesting articles in relation to that on ChristianPost.com. That relates articles that you don't find in the news media in general, or logging on to Decision Magazine of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Just this week, Franklin Graham wrote that the storm is coming. The storm is coming. John MacArthur suggests that our own culture is rapidly taking on the characteristics that we find in the book of Acts. The book of Acts environment was unfriendly to the followers of Jesus, to say the least. It was pagan and opposed to anything and everything that was Christian. And that environment of the 21st century church is now worldwide, and as I suggest, making its inroads into our country, the United States, as well. But let's see how it began, as this persecution now shifts from the Jewish leadership. It will not end there, but it shifts from the Jewish leader leadership now to the state. Acts 12, verses 1 to 5. About that time, that is about the time that, that uh, Saul and Barnabas were ministering in Antioch, as Acts chapter 11 accounts, and as they go to Jerusalem with aid, about that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. 
And when he saw that he pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great, the one who ruled Judea at the birth of Jesus. Agrippa did all that he could to curry favor with the Jews and keep peace for Rome. Thus he launched an attack against the leadership of the church at Jerusalem. Persecution often accompanies progress. And we see progress in the church. And we've seen it in these initial chapters, these first 11 chapters of Acts. We've seen the church progress and grow and flourish. Persecution accompanies progress. These were tense and traumatic times. And as Bruce Barton and Grant Osborne of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School one time penned, God was not finished with the church at Jerusalem, nor the Jewish element of Christianity. Even though persecution was coming and it was growing more and more intense and now coming from the state itself, God was not finished with what was happening in the church at Jerusalem. But Herod Agrippa, seeking to please his, his leadership in Rome and to please the Jewish people as well, executed or beheaded James, the brother of John, an apostle of Jesus. Another James surfaces in verse 17, who is the brother of Jesus, the leader of the Jerusalem church and the author of the New Testament book that bears his name. So it's important we don't confuse these two Jameses. James and John were brothers, they were apostles, and James that now appears on the scene later on here in Acts 12 and then into the further into the book of Acts was the brother of Jesus, the leader of the church of Jerusalem, and then he authored the book that bears his name in the New Testament. There's an interesting sidelight of the two brothers, James and John. James became the first of the apostles to die, and John was the last, many decades later one who wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the book of Revelation, as he was on the island of Patmos because of his faith in the Lord Jesus. But his brother James, the first to die, he was the last to die. But seeing how the death of James pleased the Jews, Herod had the other prominent leader of the Jerusalem church in prison, the Apostle Peter. Peter was visible. He was ministering with John. Why not in prison, John, James' brother. Well, we don't know, except that, that Agrippa thought that Peter was more visible, probably more prominent, so he had him imprisoned after he had executed James. A 16-man squad of soldiers guarded Peter, and four at a time for three-hour shifts. Herod determined to secure Peter until after the Passover when he would be executed. He wanted to make sure that somebody didn't break in and, and free Peter during the Passover festivities. But there was in the making something of which Herod had no knowledge, but which, but what was to alter the situation dramatically. Verse 5 becomes key to interpreting the events of chapter 12. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. The New American Standard Bible and some other translations read, the church kept on praying. The New International Version reads, the church was earnestly praying. That is intensely, fervently, persistently, agonizingly they were praying. Someone has said that prayer is the gymnasium of the soul. And certainly these early believers were sweating it out intensely, fervently, persistently, agonizingly, earnestly in prayer after James' death and Peter in prison. For what did, they, what did they pray? How did they pray? Well, we're not told. But perhaps they prayed that Peter be strong even to death. Perhaps they prayed that he'd be able to witness to the guards because there were six of them in a 24, 16 of them in a 24-hour period caring for him and watching over him. Perhaps they prayed that he'd have a miraculous escape. We don't really know how they prayed. How would you and I have prayed? 
how do we pray? Do we ever think through and kind of analyze our prayers to see whether or not they are biblical or scriptural? Does prayer really change things? Does prayer really change people? Or is it merely a form, something that we're expected to do as followers of Jesus? How important does the church consider prayer today? We see how importantly they considered it in that young church in Acts 12. How important does the church consider prayer today? The answer to the reality of prayer that brings change is revealed in the account of Peter's midnight jail delivery. The answer to whether prayer makes any difference is revealed in this episode that next takes place. I'm going to read these verses, 6 through 17, and then we'll go back and highlight some of them individually. Verse 6, Now when Herod was about to bring him, that Peter, out, on that very night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so, and he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And Peter went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When he had passed through the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Verse 12. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Peter knocked at the entrance, the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet, and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. Verse 6, when Herod was about to bring Peter out, God is always on time, is he not? The very night before the trial, not during the Passover of seven or eight days, but just before the trial, the very night before the trial, God intervenes in the situation. Verse 7, we're told that An angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in his cell, and Peter was struck on the side, and the angel woke him up. The very night before the trial, what's Peter doing? He's sleeping. He's sleeping. Now, Peter had a habit of sleeping through crises. The night before Jesus' execution, the night before his imprisonment and execution and all of those things, Jesus had taken Peter, James, and John with him to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed intensely during that time. And the disciples, because the day was so long and stressful and intense itself, they couldn't stay awake. They fell asleep. So Peter, in a way, kind of had a habit of sleeping through crisis. But Peter's sleeping through the night before his crucifixion. Would you have been sleeping? Would I have been? People today are restless. In fact, we can say that people today, especially in 2020, are anxious people. We're an anxious people today. School has started now, and kids are anxious, and parents are anxious, and school staff are anxious, how everything's going to work out. People are really anxious today. And the ministry of the church has a prime opportunity to, to minister to people in these anxiety-prone days, not add to the stress, but add, add to the how they can relate to all of this. But we're restless people. The night before, we must make a decision. The night before, we face maybe an important meeting. 
we find sleep difficult. But the scriptures encourage us to relax and trust God. Now, it's easier said than done. Like someone says, you need to reduce stress in your life. Oh, yeah, sure. How? Reduce life? Quit living? Life is stressful today. But from the scriptures, we need to learn how to trust God and to meet our anxiety-ridden days. And if we do so, we'll find enough time in every day to do God's will that day. Sometimes we're just overwhelmed with everything we have to do in a day. And if we learn to trust God through the day, he'll give us the strength and the opportunities to get done what he wants us to get done. And then we can sleep, we can try to relax, we can rest in the midst of threatening situations. There are two passages of scripture, one from the Old Testament, one from the New, that can aid us in that. Psalm 27. Verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? People are fearful today because of what's happening. Draw on, draw on Psalm 27, verse 1 and verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. That's Psalm 27 in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And from the old living Bible states it plainly. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank him for his answers. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts, what you think, and your hearts, what you believe, quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. So draw on those two biblical admonitions, if you will, Psalm 27 and Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Allow me to inter intersperse a, a, an example of this that occurred to some good friends of ours just this spring, early in the pandemic. A friend of ours was undergoing, was to undergo serious heart surgery. In the hospital, they allowed his family to come and see him the night before, and his wife told us later that he was resting and he was at ease. And the next day, the hospital staff told his wife as well that he was slept very peacefully that night. But the surgeon had told him that the results were not good, and they probably would not end up well. But he slept peacefully that night. The next day, he underwent heart surgery, did not survive it. But he slept peacefully, at peace in God's hands. That's what the Lord wants us to do in our anxiety-prone, ridden, stressful days today. Unless we learn to sleep, to relax, to trust God in times of stress, there'll be times when we don't get much of any sleep. But we communicate our faith best during difficult times. So God's giving us opportunities through this whole thing, this spring and summer and now into the fall, to express our faith in the midst of very restless and anxious times. Verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I'm sure the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod. You believe in angels? Well, not hell's angels or not guardian angels. Maybe you believe in guardian angels. Some people do. Some people believe that every one of us has a garden, guardian angel. Others aren't so sure. And Bible students uh, fall on various sides of this. Some say that scriptures teach it. Others say scripture doesn't teach it. But the study of angels is intriguing. If you were ever to study that in the scriptures. Whenever they appear in scripture, they deal in real situations and problems of life. They come on the scene in real life situations. This second deliverance of Peter is by an angel as well, as was the first in verse 19 of chapter 5. So Peter's second deliverance here in verse 11 comes from an angel as well. Verse 12, when Peter realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. The site of the Last Supper, more than likely, People were gathered there. They were praying, as we learned earlier. 
it now becomes the nerve center of the Jerusalem church, where everything was happening, where people were meeting to pray. It was the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, the author of the second gospel, Matthew Mark. And when Peter came to the house of Mary, and he's knocking on the door, and one of the servant girls comes and, and recognizes his voice, but fails to let him in, and he run, she runs back and says, Peter's at the door. They say that, that uh, you're out of your mind. Or as Eugene Peterson translates it in the message, you're crazy. It couldn't be Peter. He's in prison. But prayer is power. Prayer is powerful. Earnest, believing prayer grabs hold of the power of God and results occur. Something happens when followers of Jesus pray. Something happens when the church prays. Man's extremity becomes God's opportunity. And the church learned that prayer is powerful in crisis situations. That prayer can alter apparently impossible situations. We can take that from this 12th chapter of Acts. In response to the prayer of the church, the Lord intervened on the very night before Peter was to be executed at the hands of Herod Agrippa. The angel led him from prison, and from there Peter headed for John Mark's home. In few places is the reality of answered prayer more clearly taught than in this passage. One can picture the groggy Peter, as one Bible student has written, thinking that he was dreaming, verse 9, needing the instruction of his angelic liberator to help him get his clothes on, Peter complied with the angel's direction, but he had to be reminded to put on his coat. Wrap the cloak around you, the angel told him. Then he followed the angel out of the cell. In few places is the reality of answered prayer more clearly taught than right here in Acts chapter 12. But the question might arise, how about James, the brother of John, whom Herod executed? Why didn't God deliver him? Didn't the church pray for him? They probably did. But perhaps God saw James' work as completed, whereas God wanted Peter for more responsibility in the church. We can be assured that in the lives of the followers of Jesus, God does not allow things to happen at random, by chance, out of fate, or out of luck. God is in charge of us. He's in charge of his church. He is sovereign. He is Lord. He makes no mistakes. He is trustworthy, even in times when we can't understand why things happen like they do. Why God takes someone in the prime of life, in the prime of ministry, and then he allows others to, to lay in nursing homes for years. We don't know why. We only can know that God is sovereign, Lord, makes no mistakes, and he can be trusted. This passage reveals a great deal about the prayer habits of the early church. And as we study these verses, several questions come to mind that challenge our attitudes toward prayer. And maybe they will to ours, too, as we look at these briefly. The first of all, is my praying limited to what I think God can do? Is my praying limited to what I think God can do? Do we really believe that with God all things are possible? The years apparently had taken a toll on the confident prayer of the church because they were shocked. They were unbelieving when Peter showed up at Mark's home. But are we any different sometimes today? It's one of the most human scenes in all of Scripture. It points out our humanity, that we pray but then are surprised when God answers. After a prolonged drought, a small rural ch church held a prayer session to pray for rain. And out of the entire group, as the story is told, one person, a youngster, a young boy, showed up with an umbrella because he believed that God would bring rain in answer to their prayers. When we prayed, we believe God to that extent, or are our prayers limited to what we think God can do. Related to this is a second question that confronts us. Do we believe more in the power of man than in the unlimited power of God? 
Do we believe more in man's power or God's power that's unlimited? Peter was in prison. Guard was chained to each wrist and two at the door of the cell. James didn't escape. The same thing's probably going to happen to Peter that happened to James. Are we sometimes reluctant to pray boldly and fearful that God may not answer as we ask? And so we don't pray so boldly and fervently. But we need not seek to protect God's reputation. If the prayer of ours is answered differently than that for which we ask, it doesn't mean that God doesn't hear or answer prayer. So with that confidence, we can pray, leaving the results in God's hands and trusting him. Number three, am I ever so occupied in praying that I fail to recognize the answer? Are we so, sometimes so engaged that we fail to answer or fail to, to sense that God is answering our prayer? That's what happened here in Acts 12, isn't it? They were so involved in their prayer period, their prayer time, that they didn't realize that Peter was standing right outside the door and the scripture says he kept on knocking until finally someone opened the door. They weren't prepared for the Lord to interrupt their prayer with an answer. You ever some been surprised at the answer for which you have been praying? In my experience, I'm sure it has been yours as a follower of Jesus as well. You're praying fervently and earnestly and then surprised when God answers the prayer. Perhaps our response, our unbelief, our shock at answers accounts for why things sometimes do not occur as we pray. So these questions surface out of Acts 12. Is my praying limited to what I think God can do? Do I believe more in the power of man than in the power of God? And one Bible scholar writes, Do you get the picture? Those ragtag, beleaguered Christians possessed greater power than Herod's hordes. The legions of Rome barred the door, but it only took one of God's secret agents to liberate the captive. Peter's experience reacquainted the embattled church with the true nature of her strength. No matter how grim life might appear, God and his angels are present and they're ministering, and he can deliver us at any time he sees fit. In his study of the book of Acts, Kent Hughes writes, If we ever think God does not understand or cannot or will not have help, we have bad theology. If we could open our eyes right now, Wherever we are, whatever is going around us, we would say God is in this place. God is in this place. And then, am I ever so occupied that I fail to recognize the answer? Those three questions you can find on the lesson notes that you can download from here or, or find on the YouTube channel as well. Those three questions, am I praying limited? I believe more in the power of man than God. Am I ever so occupied that I fail to realize or recognize God's answers? Those questions can cause us to examine our attitudes of prayer. And they should enable us to pray freely, boldly, confidently that God will answer. But at the same time, acknowledging that he sees all of life in its complete and proper perspective. Whereas you and I see only today. But God sees the whole picture. Peter encountered the power of God head on. It delivered him from prison. It saved his life for future ministry. And so is prayer really effective? We'd better believe it. Because as someone has written, amazing coincidence happen when we pray. Amazing coincidence happen when we pray. But as we close out our study of chapter 12, we see another who faced the power of God, but with far different results. These last verses of chapter 12. Then Herod, the one who had executed James, the one who had imprisoned Peter, went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. After he had executed the soldiers, because Peter had somehow gotten out of prison, he leaves Jerusalem, goes to Caesarea, stays there. He'd been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Now they joined together and sought an audience with him. 
After securing the support of Blasted, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. But immediately, Herod did not give praise to God. An angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. What a way to go, huh? Eaten by worms and died. Luke's record of Herod's painful death corresponds to the account of the first century Jewish historical author Josephus, who wrote that Herod suffered for five days with intense intestinal pain before he died. This 12th chapter closes then with Luke giving us another progress report on the early church, verse 24. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. So we have in this 12th chapter the, the execution of James, the imprisonment and the release of Peter, the, the death of Herod Agrippa, and the further progress of the church. Luke's fourth report of seven that he'll give in the book of Acts, reporting on how the church is doing. And in so doing, it sets the stage for Saul. For Saul, Barnabas, and Mark, as they return from Jerusalem to Antioch, from their mission of mercy to, find, to the financially struggling believers there. We left Saul and Barnabas in verses 29 and 30 of chapter 11 going to Jerusalem with a gift of mercy from the church at Antioch. Now we'll find that, that chapter 13 picks up with them again after this kind of parentheses that Acts chapter 12 is, setting the stage for Saul, Barnabas, and Mark not only to return, but we'll see what God has in store for them next. These verses illustrate the effect of God's power on a person who depends on his relationship to God, as Peter did. Some 20 years after this incident in Acts 12, Peter was to pen, quoting Psalm 34, 15, and 16, in 1 Peter 3 and verse 12, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. As Peter quotes Psalm 34, verses 15 and 16, and 1 Peter 3 and 12, it describes Acts chapter 12 as well. 1 Peter 12a, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, Acts 12, 1 to 4. His eyes are open to their prayer, verses 5 to 17 of Acts 12. But the Lord, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, verses 18 to 25 of Acts 12. So, Psalm 34, verses 15 16, is quoted by Peter in 1 Peter 3, 12, 20 years after this incident, and it relates very closely. Peter probably remembering this incident, how could he forget it? And how it's an answer to prayer in Acts 12. So Psalm 34, 1 Peter 3, Acts 12, they all relate the same situation. If our relationship is through trust in Christ as God's Son, as our Savior and our Lord, God's power will strengthen and spiritually prosper us. If our relationship to God is superficial or non-existent, we'll encounter God's power and judgment, as did Herod. So the result is very clear in this 12th chapter. If our relationship to God is, is that which trusts in him, relays each day's events and all our anxiety and all our stresses on him, and we see his power, God will strengthen us for every situation. But if we do not, judgment will eventually fall as it did on Herod, who claimed that he was a god. Are we right related to God? Are we nurturing it through confident prayer and trust in Christ? how we must, and how we must be encourager of others to do the same as well. This prayer from the ministry of Kent Hughes at the conclusion of his study on Acts 12 is worth repeating. God, we believe with all our hearts that you can deliver us anytime from anything. 
our master we believe in the our master we believe in the ministry of angels lord we believe in the power of prayer to bring about these things in and through our lives thank you for reacquainting us in this chapter with our position and power in you in jesus name amen that's acts chapter 12 it's a full one next time acts 13 a new phase of the church takes place just as we're in a new phase of the church in 2020 and beyond as well a mighty mission movement is launched that's still thriving today and it's still a part of the ministry of the church today as well thanks for joining us today see you next time in acts chapter 13